David France, class of 70 again. I want to start out with, uh, first of all, thanking Richard Batch. I don't think he's here, but this is a video that he prepared uh, for a prior reunion. I don't know, maybe the 40th or something, but uh, it uh, brings back a lot of good memories. And uh, you know, welcome, I think most of the class of 70, but welcome to class 71 and 15 and 16, if, if any of you all uh, showed up for this, and welcome to our program reflecting on the 1960s and open conversation about the impact of this period on our lives, its legacy, and its meaning today. And I just want to briefly give you a little backdrop on how this came about, how it evolved. Um, planning for this reunion actually began four years ago, in 2018. Uh, we were sidetracked by something, oh, the pandemic. Uh, but a conversation about doing something special for this, our 50th reunion started. And, you know, we didn't want this just to be another reunion with the same old programs. We wanted to do something special. And so there was a group that got together and started a conversation. Mario Damiata, Larry Klusman, and Tom Sneeringer, who unfortunately is under the weather and is missing this reunion weekend, even though he did a tremendous amount of work uh, for the weekend. But it was Mario who really planted the seed about you know, developing a special lecture that could look back on the 60s in a conversation about its impact on today's culture, lifestyle, and politics. We don't want, we didn't want just a history lesson. We didn't just want folks sharing war stories about how I was on the top of White Bravier when the city burned, along with me. You know, my brother, my sister, my uncle, everybody at Georgetown says they were up there. <laughs> those were the days. We wanted more than that. We wanted to reflect um, on the legacy of this. So, tremendous amount of work by Mario, by Larry, and then we are lucky we brought in Bruce Stokes um, as our moderator to work on this, this program. And literally after dozens and dozens and dozens of emails, and Zoom calls, this project evolved. And the concept was, well, here we're at Georgetown, we're in Washington, D.C. Um, we've got these scholars who might want to participate in the program. And through Mario and Larry's efforts, we are fortunate to have three distinguished scholars uh, with us today. From Georgetown, Professor Catherine Benton Cohen, Professor Michael Kazin, and then up the road, Professor Leonard Steinhorn to lead this panel discussion uh, that we have uh, are going today. So um, our goal here is to take 90 minutes to look back, to recall what happened here and elsewhere during those years, and reflect on what it means today, and hopefully make some connection between our really uh, crazy world today and the 1960s when we were here on campus. So I'm going to introduce Bruce and then he will take the lead and introduce our professors uh, and then we'll get rolling. Uh, Bruce is one of our classmates, class of 1970. Um, he is a non-resident fellow at the Jet Jeff German Marshall Fund a former international economics correspondent for the National Journal, a former senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund, former senior fellow at the Council of Human Relations. And I'm not finished yet. I mean, this is really humbling to hear about what one of our classmates has accomplished. He's also a director of Global Economic Attitudes at the Pew Research Center. And Bruce is a graduate of the School of Foreign Service Johns Hopkins University School for Advanced International Studies, and he is co-authored of the book, America Against the World, How We Are Different and Why We Are Disliked, Time 2016. Bruce Stokes. Thank you. And welcome everybody, and it's great to see uh, some familiar faces, and we really look forward to uh, our conversation here and our insights from our panelists. And, as importantly, the comments and questions that we'll get from the audience, we really want to in involve you uh, in this discussion. Uh, I think we're, we have a, the prospect of a very informative and, and insightful and uh, stimulating discussion 
so let me uh, introduce our panelists briefly. Uh, in the middle, uh, we have uh, Michael Kazin, uh, uh, is a professor of history here at Georgetown, uh, an expert on US politics and social movements in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, he co-wrote a book called, uh, very appropriately for this discussion, America Divided the Civil War of the 1960s. Some might think we're about to head into another civil war, so you might have another book to write, uh, Michael. Uh, and he was, uh, at one point, the editor of Dissent uh, magazine. Uh, to my right, immediate right, is Professor Leonard Steinhorn. Len is a professor at American University, teaches communications and history at American, is the author of The Greater Generation in Defense of the Baby Boom Legacy. We'd like to thank you for defending us. Wow. <laughs> And uh, we have with us Catherine Benton Cohen, who teaches history here at Georgetown as well. Her most recent book is Inventing the Immigration Problem, the Dillingham Commission and its Legacy. Uh, her interests include the history of race and immigration and women and gender in the United States. Uh, so uh, let me tell you what we hope to accomplish here. The 60s were obviously a very relevant period. Uh, I don't have to tell you this. You all live through it. Um, uh, there's much to discuss. Uh, but because we only have 90 minutes, uh, we thought we'd focus on three issues, the uh, anti-Vietnam War movement, the social reform movements of the 1960s, and the legacy of the 1960s. We're going to devote about 20 minutes to each of those discussions, uh, with uh, the final five minutes of those sessions open to comments and questions from the audience. I must warn you, if you start giving us long speeches, I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> because we got to be respectful of everybody's time, and we don't want one or two people just to, to, uh, to take all the time that, the, that we have allotted to a group discussion. Uh, Let's start off, uh, uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to briefly tell us how they would uh, describe the 60s in terms of defining the features and uh, events that took place. Uh, is there some overarching theme uh, that we take away from the 60s? Who won, who lost, who gained, who lost? Just to kind of warm us up. And um, um, so why don't we start with, with, uh, uh, with Professor uh, Benton Cole. Can you all hear me if I speak at this tone? Yeah. We don't have a mic, so <clears throat> I'll try. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm going to say at the outset that I am not an expert on the 1960s and, in fact, was born in 1972. My parents are college class of 69 and 70, so I very much feel like I'm that kid who kind of crept down the stairs and stayed up late at the party, so um, <laughs> it's nice to feel young. Uh, uh, but the reason why I'm here, I think, is because I'm trained as a women's historian. I teach US women's history here at Georgetown. Um, and also, um, I, in the pandemic, in fall of 2020, developed a, a small course, a freshman seminar, on women's history at Georgetown. And that came out of um, an effort uh, that was uh, delayed, postponed, that hasn't happened um, because of uh, the pandemic. In March 2020, late March 2020, there was supposed to be a panel celebrating the 50th anniversary of women's admission into the college. And a number of people what, like it didn't happen in your staff? We've been here before. In the yeah, it was a college celebration. I, I know, I've been teaching women's history. And, yeah, so I'm going to talk about that. What about the rest of us? Sorry. Okay, um, it was a college event, but it did raise this issue, and I was asked to be on a panel for that, and it got postponed. Then I thought, well, why don't we have this be a high touch opportunity uh, where I can teach a small group of students? So what I want to say is what I've learned from the students, and I brought a lot of handouts um, from things that they looked at, and they do relate to this issue of themes. So I'm a graduate of the U University of Wisconsin's Women's History Program, which is a PhD program, and the field of women's history really came out of the social movements of the 
uh, Michael knows that people, women who were active in the feminist movements of the 1960s, many of whom in the women's history field actually got PhDs in other specialties because women's history as a field didn't yet exist. There had been a version in the progressive era that had kind of fallen fallow, right, as, as politics changed. Those women kind of created a new field of women's history that came out of the 1960s. That field, those are the people that trained me. So for example, my dissertation director was a woman named Linda Gordon. The next generation of people started thinking about the movement a little bit differently, right? Because we didn't participate in it, right? And thought about women's history in different ways. Now, let's fast forward that to teaching my class in the fall of 2020 and the fall of 2021. This is a course that students have to apply to. There are high school seniors when they apply. The, I, in two years of about 15, 18 students each, I had one male student. And here's the thing, his mother and his aunt both went to Georgetown and his aunt told him that he should take this class. <laughs> which was actually really wonderful because he had gone to a boys Catholic high school. And he really enjoyed learning about this. But here's the takeaways that I learned from my students. Since my parents are exactly the same age as this age group that started in, 19, uh, in the late 1960s, I had heard a lot of stories about the experience of starting college during the tumultuous Vietnam years and women's rights movement. And I wasn't as shocked. But it was really interesting to see the students' reactions. So for example, one of their favorite documents, and some of you may remember it, and I brought a Xerox copy, is a pamphlet that all women undergraduates received at Georgetown called Miss G Goes to Georgetown. <laughs> and Miss G Goes to Georgetown had existed prior to, the women, to women entering the college. There are versions as early as the 1960s for women in nursing school and SFS. And it tells women how to dress. <laughs> what the dress code is for different occasions, what length skirt you might like to have, uh, where you're allowed to sunbathe, what the rule on the top of Darnell Hall, that's the only place you're allowed to sunbathe, just so you know, you could not sunbathe on, on, the, on the lawn. Um, uh, rules about dating, obviously, expectations of behavior, curfew, absolutely, curfew, men got that information too, but one of my students noticed that, um, or actually I think the panels noticed, yeah. right, that Women were penalized for... My recollection is that if you kissed your date goodnight on the yes. steps of Darnell Hall, or whatever, whatever the other hall was married, you would end up, nothing would happen to the boy, and the girl would be uh, on campus the next weekend. No PDA. No PDA. No yeah. Okay, so, um, but my students were completely fascinated, fascinated by Miss G goes to Georgetown. They were absolutely taken aback, and I saw it through their eyes as a consequence. But the other thing that they did is they did a wide, they did websites, they did oral histories. We're almost at time. Yeah, we we need to Yeah, that's fine. They did websites, oral histories, and one thing they noticed is that they interviewed a lot of people from those classes who felt co-education was not a big deal, as opposed to a big deal. In other words. The students were ready, male and female. It was the administration that had to adjust. And I think that that shows the mixed legacy of the 60s in a good way. I remember professors in the, fall, the spring of 1970 saying, if we let women into the College of Arts and Sciences, we won't be able to tell the same jokes. They were already telling them in the farm service. Yeah. <laughs> All right, calm down, Carol. Let, let, let. Any overarching things you want to highlight? So I guess there's one thing that um, from the 60s that symbolizes the decade that I wish we all had more of today, which is our hair. Um, <laughs> so what does that tell us, uh, hair? It tells us that the generation was in many ways rebelling against what existed beforehand. I love this quote from the actual 1953 film, The Wild Ones, when the Marlon Brando character was asked, hey Johnny, what are you rebelling against? And his response was, what do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Right? Um, and so, in, in essence, this was a generation in many ways, at least through the prism of the media at the time of rebellion. But I'd like to add some different uh, perspectives on that. I would argue that a lot of it has to do with rectifying America, transforming our culture, 
And by rectifying America, I mean bringing America back to the ideals that this generation was really brought up to believe in. You are raised sort of with the World War II, with the sense that we are a virtuous nation. We fought the good war. We did all the right things for liberty, equality, and freedom. And yet, when those people came home, they sort of looked the other way when those wonderful suburbs, like with these idyllic names like Oak Park and Fresh Meadows, that black people weren't allowed to live in those same suburbs. And in fact, um, Levitt, who built Levittown, said if I allowed any black people into our neighborhood, 90 or 95 percent of the white people wouldn't want to move in. And in fact, in 1957, in Levittown in Pennsylvania, there was actually a riot when a black middle class family wanted to move in, and the whites resisted, and it became a national story. And in fact, if you were Willie Mays, celebrity didn't help you, because when the Giants moved out to San Francisco, he initially couldn't buy a home until the mayor intervened. So you had race being one of the original sins that was carried into the 1950s um, that people were saying, wait a second, you tell us that we are truth, justice, and the American way, but it isn't that way in reality. And then you have the Cold War and the distortions of the Cold War, and in the name of freedom, we were squashing dissent. And then we were having things like duck and cover and being told that if you put a newspaper over your head, you could protect yourself from the atomic bomb. And there were videos that I've seen that I show in my classes. Oh, radiation sickness, it's not so bad, you'll get over it. Okay? Um, you mean that wasn't true? No, it wasn't true. <laughs> he still believes in the authorities. But the, whole point, the whole point of the 1960s is that people understood that the authorities weren't necessarily telling them the truth. And then, as layer upon layer began to be uncovered, for example, Silent Spring with Rachel Carson. The phrase Silent Spring is about a silent springtime in which the birds will no longer chirp because they all will have died from DDT. And there were so many other incidents in that era. Probably many of you don't know about Denora, Pennsylvania in 1948, in which there was a blanket of soot and particulate matter over that town that killed 20 people and hospitalized 600. Um, so, um, so they are. And then you have Ralph Nader, um, unsafe at any speed. So when we were told to trust the corporations, this generation said, wait a second, how do we trust all of those people? So in effect, what you had was a culture in which if you were black, you were told to be separate. If you were a woman, you were told to stay in, uh, uh, in an apron. Um, if you were uh, gay, you were told to stay in the closet. If you were Jewish, you were told to stay inconspicuous. And if you marched to your own drum, you were told to either stay silent or not rock the boat or cause any problems. So this generation woke up, um, fed in part by Mad Magazine with its wonderful scathing uh, uh, uncovering of all forms of hypocrisy, and started to realize that the America that they were told to love wasn't the America they were living in, so they wanted to rectify it. And I know we're running out of time, but I'll just yeah. say one other thing. From a long haul perspective, the 1960s was really a transformation. You know, in the 60s, people like to use the word revolution. You know, I, you know, I knew Abby Hoffman, and he was talking about the revolution all the time. Um, but in the 1960s, it became a transformation. And I like to tell my students it was a transformation because there were concentric circles of change. And while not everybody changed to the same degree, the, the values, the norms, the attitudes, the ideas of American society shifted fundamentally and ultimately infused the institutions that we all live in today. And just look at the universities that we have and how the values are different from the 1960s as what you were talking about to where we are today. So that transformation you can see in institutions, not only universities, but everywhere around the country. But I'm out of time. Mike. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, Mark. Yeah. Uh, thanks. For everybody put this together. It's been a long haul, I know. Uh, many emails, and I'm glad it's going to happen. I should say, I, I, my 50th reunion was supposed to be two years ago, but something happened. And uh, not here, but at a different college. Uh, so uh, I feel like, oh, I finally have a reunion. <laughs> uh, at least for half an hour and a half. Anyway. Um, so really, you know, uh, some of the things I'm going to say, you know, quickly are uh, really echo some of the things Len said and my absolutely young colleague uh, Katie said as well. Uh, and, um, uh, and really it's sort of summed up by the famous Faulkner quote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Uh, and that really applies to the 60s. Um, and, and, and why? I mean, I, I would argue, you know, 
What happened to the 1830s is mostly past, you know. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, we're still arguing a lot about, about the legacy of slavery, but um, the Civil War. But uh, what happened in the 60s, I think, historically, uh, was quite profound because so many problems, contradictions, issues were all thrown up at the same time. Um, and um, really profound ones. In many ways, we're still dealing with almost all of them. Let me just you know, mention them very quickly. Obviously, race and racism. Sexuality. Um, uh, in Katie's talk, she gave you know, some, some reference to that. Uh, you know, in, in the book American Divided that I co-wrote, um, you know, we talk about uh, a big case at Columbia that a woman was, uh, was going to be expelled from Barnard, actually, not Columbia. A woman couldn't go to Columbia yet because she was living with her boyfriend. <laughs> um, and that was so out of, you know, uh, outside the pale. Uh, styles of music uh, and film and art. Um, ways of getting high <laughs> change. Um, um, we talked about disabled rights, the fact that disabled people had rights, you know, that very idea. And the whole rights consciousness, I think, uh, which, you know, didn't come from nowhere, but it, it really took off in the 60s. And we're doing very much now. The meaning of work. People talk about, do we really have to work so hard? Is it necessary to really, shouldn't, shouldn't bad jobs be automated, you know? What about the meaning of consumption? So people began to argue consumption was a bad thing. Herbert Marcuse, famous you know, Marxist Freudian philosopher, very popular among some people in the 60s and the 70s, argued that you know, consumerism was making America a, a sort of a controlled society. People just worked to get more things. Um, religion, Vatican II, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, changed the Catholic Church, you know, the idea the mass was not going to be said in Latin, you know? Uh, well, you, you, a lot of you remember that, I'm sure. Um, also, um, you know, all of us are up here Jewish, actually, three of us at least, you know. Uh, you know, women rabbis. You know, what a, what a weird thing, women rabbis. Um, and uh, also how to stand, understand the U.S. role in the world, you know. Uh, the Vietnam War was such a central part of the 60s. And ever since then, there's been a much more lively debate than there was earlier in the Cold War about should the United States intervene around the world? And of course, we're having that debate now uh, in many ways about Ukraine. Uh, and we had it about Iraq. Uh, environmental politics, Bruce mentioned Silent Spring, but there was no environmental movement, no mass environmental movement really before the 1960s. Uh, and that's really Earth Day is 1970, and then since then, we've, Earth Day has been celebrated every year. Um, of course, environmental problems have got worse in the world, but uh, there is an international environmental movement uh, which got born in the 60s uh, as well. Uh, and, you know, as all three of us know up here, US history itself, the way you teach history changed you know, uh, in the 60s. Black history, uh, immigration history is a major kind of history, which Katie's written wonderful books about. Um, uh, uh, history of, of gays and lesbians and transgender people, uh, environmental history, uh, transnational history. Um, I mean, if you read pick any history book written by, you know, a really good historian these days, uh, especially an academic one, it's written about topics that uh, might have been written about before, but if they do it, they put it completely differently than it would have been written. Uh, uh, before the 1960s. The 60s really changed, America. and we're arguing about history, about how history should be understood, and a lot of that, those arguments come from the, from the 60s. Um, so anyways, we're still arguing about many of these issues, um, most unresolved, I think, uh, so why we keep arguing about them. Um, think about arguments probably about abortion, about trans transgender rights, about critical race theory, um, and of course all of this can be argued about endlessly because of something invented in the 60s. The internet, <laughs> invented by uh, a thing called ARPANET, which was invented by a, uh, uh, who's probably knows, by DARPA, which is still around, part of the Defense Department, um, research arm of the Defense Department. Um, it was only among scientists at first, but of course, uh, now it's in all our pockets. So. Um, and, and also, finally, um, why are these things still, still going on? You know, we can talk about that in discussion, but one of the reasons I think, and this isn't talked about enough, is that there's no majority political party in this country. It has not been, arguably, for the last 50 years or so. Uh, New Deal coalition fell apart in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, and think about it, since uh, Richard Nixon resigned in 1974, remember? Um, uh, we've had six presidential, uh, 12 presidential elections. Democrats have won six, Republicans have won six. And two of the ones Republicans won, they didn't get the, majority, the popular vote majority, but as we know, you don't need to do that to get elected in this country. Um, so in many ways, I think because uh, we, we, have had, we haven't had the excessive polarization we have now over the last 50 years, it's gone up and down, 
but um, it's very hard for people from one party to compromise people from the other party, I think, because it's sort of a zero-sum game. You help the, other, the governing party uh, get something passed, and it helps the governing party, and it hurts your party. Uh, and so as long as we have this you know, very fierce rivalry with no majority party in national elections, at least for any, any length of time, uh, I think some of these issues, which are always political issues, not just cultural issues, are going to be unresolved. pivot now to uh, talking about the Vietnam War and the Vietnam War movement, anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, um, some of you may have, I vividly remember going on the March in the Pentagon in October of 1967. And I must sheepishly admit, I went in part to laugh at the hippies. And only to see people in the march who looked like my mother and father in what Richard Nixon once called good Republican cloth coats. <laughs> And frankly, it was a wake-up call for me to say, I need to know more about what's going on here because this is not just some fringe movement. But uh, Len, why don't we start with you? Who were these anti-war protesters? Uh, where'd they come from? What motivated them in your mind? Um, uh, and bear in mind, we only have about uh, 15 minutes, so we, we've got to keep everybody's answers a little bit short, OK? So I think you have to break down the anti-war movement into sort of different segments because early on I would call it a peace movement, a movement that was repulsed by the idea of the United States going to war and what it was doing in Southeast Asia and ar arguably incensed at the lies that were our government was telling us early on that many people knew about because if there were journalists in Vietnam who were reporting this stuff. You go back to Morley Sabres classic 1965 story basically showing our, our soldiers you know, burning huts uh, in villages uh, and reporting on that, yet we were being told that there was light at the end of the tunnel. So there was a peace movement that was you know, uh, incensed by what we were doing, uh, the damage we were creating, uh, the, the, the harm that we were you know, in, in imposing upon the people of Vietnam, um, and also rejecting what our government was saying. But that began, as I said earlier, with concentric circles. It began to expand to what I would call from a peace movement to an anti-war movement. And so the anti-war movement, effectively, was less about the people of Vietnam, though it was still fertilized by people in the peace movement, but more about the loss of our own uh, young, young men and the people who were dying in Vietnam and the damage it was causing to our country. And then you had, even beyond that, people like Richard Nixon uh, proclaiming himself a peace candidate in 1968, yet really having no, he had a so-called secret plan for peace, which was very secret because I don't even think he knew it. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, you know, in, in effect, you had the whole notion of how do you get out of Vietnam, continue the war, but ultimately get out with honor. So you had different gradations of how people were looking at the Vietnam War. You even had a lot of those folks who, you know, 50, 60 years later, would become sort of the white working class Reagan supporters who opposed the war because they didn't like the fact that their kids were in the war and getting killed, but as much as they disliked the war, they disliked the Vietnam War protesters on campus even more, okay? So again, there were different gradations of it. But I will say this, that uh, one of the great quotes of the 1960s comes from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And what he says, and, and I quote him exactly, the ultimate tragedy of Birmingham was not the brutality of the bad people, but the silence of the good people. And in many ways, what Martin Luther King did was indict an entire generation of people for being silent, for knowing better, and looking to protect order rather than pursue justice, and, and, and pr protect order out of their own convenience and desire to stick with the status quo. I will say this, one of the differences with Vietnam is that many of the good people began to speak up, and I think that was what made this so unusual, because it was the first real mass movement against mini mil any military action that our government was committing. But Kate, a question, because you looked at some of these uh, uh, groups that were becoming of age and, and more integrated into the public discussion uh, during the 60s. Um, you know, one could be somewhat cynical about at least the beginnings of the, of the anti-war movement. You know, was this just people our age? 
who didn't want to go get killed, you know? Was it a sense of youthful rebellion? If it hadn't been the war, we would have rebelled against something else because that's what young people do, you know? Was it, um, uh, was it about class and race? Uh, I mean, I vividly, I took the, the draft physical in May of 1970 uh, at Fort Meade, 106 of us took their physical that day, 100 blacks, six whites, six people flunked at physical, five whites and one black. You know, I was one of them, so I was really happy. But the point being, I mean, what could have been more racist than this? Right? So I'm just curious to get your sense of how that played out, or at least your perception of how it played out. So Michael's the expert on, on some of this, but I'm going to give a perspective that is partly about my current research yeah. and also about my father-in-law, because yeah. I actually have learned a lot from his experience. Uh, it, it's told me a lot. So we understandably get most of this history from in the academy from people that lived through it and were activists in it, and Michael is one of them, and I want him to share a story. I learned that academically because I didn't live through Vietnam, and I was you know, learning it. But one of the things that I've realized is that is just exactly to your point about concentric circles. So um, my son, my older son is a junior and taking AP US history right now, and he just got to LBJ, and I said, I am totally fascinated by LBJ. He's the most endlessly interesting president to me because of his contradictions. And, a pre and I'm glad you're nodding because I was taught basically he was evil, right? Like there was a lot about the Vietnam generation and I thought he's actually more interesting than that because he's so complicated. Similarly, so my father-in-law, his parents were Orthodox Jewish immigrants in Akron, Ohio that had a little green grocery. Working class lived on top of a two flat uh, you know, apartment house or, you know, two, anyway, he was the only child of these immigrants. They lost their home in the 68, they lost their store in the 68 riots in Akron because their store was in an African American neighborhood. He went to the University of Akron in the mid 60s and like a good Jewish immigrants kid went to medical school and during that time, the Kent State shooting happened. He is by nature a conservative man. He is an observant Jew. He is, has centrist politics. He will still note that day as a day that changed how he viewed the world and the nation, turned him against the war, still affects his politics today. He writes screeds about voting rights. It's the cutest thing because I think of him as like the straightest man. <laughs> he writes these letters. The letters he wrote for voting rights to <laughs> Senator Sinema made my hair stand on end. <laughs> Because he thought, I'm that good kid going to school at this public Ohio university, and someone turned and shot at people just like me. And I think that shows the tipping point, right? Like his story, which I wouldn't have necessarily learned in the classroom, taught me that tipping point. Similarly, I'm writing a book about mining towns in Arizona right now, and I just wrote a paper about a strike in 1967 and 1968. Morency, Arizona, which is, to this day, a company town, old school company town had nine members of the class of 66 that Morency High School who enlisted rather than drafting, uh, getting drafted. They were five, uh, four Anglos, I think five Mexican Americans and one Navajo kid who grew up there. And six of the nine never came back. While they were in Vietnam, their fathers were on strike for better conditions and they did not see those union politics and being pro-Vietnam in conflict, and I think we forget about that moment sometimes in the university. So I share those two stories that I think illustrate your point. Mike, I'm curious, uh, you know, part of the anti-war movement was uh, the relationship between the anti-war movement and some of the more radical groups that were emerging in the 60s. The Weathermen, the Black Panthers. Uh, do you have any sense of to what extent did the fact that they all coexisted and occasionally worked together and there were transitions from one movement to the other, did that affect how the public at large saw the anti-war movement? And you know, to put it more bluntly, were some of those connections and the anti-war movement in general really responsible for getting Richard Nixon elected? No, that's a good question. And, and uh, as Katie alluded to, I was part of the anti-war movement. I was a weatherman for about six weeks, luckily no longer. I didn't go, I didn't go on the ground, I didn't bomb anybody. Um, but uh, I was just an idiot. Um, but politically. Um, but uh, uh, 
uh, and I, you know, five minutes, I have, you know, obviously <laughs> talk about this for hours. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the, the contradiction, uh, and, and Len may reference that in Canadian too in some ways, is as the anti-war as the anti-war movement got larger and the war got more unpopular, the anti-war movement got more unpopular too, because it was perceived as uh, wanting Americans to be killed. You know, it was perceived as rooting for the enemy, and some people like me did root for the enemy. Um, I must admit, and um, that was a stupid thing to do. Um, uh, it was right to oppose the war. Uh, I would still defend that, you know, forever. The idea that this was an honorable war that we could have won it. Now, a lot of historians do argue about whether the anti-war movement prolonged the war or not, uh, and certainly uh, uh, the fact that people like me in 1968, for example, because Humphrey was was uh, running and he was the vice president uh, under Lyndon Johnson, who had escalated the war uh, so much. People like me said. Well, I, I couldn't vote yet, because I was only 20, and the 18-year-old vote hadn't happened yet, but uh, people like me said, don't vote. We told people, don't vote. You know, SDS, which was the you know, group I was part of, Students for Democratic Society, we had a slogan in 68, vote in the streets, vote with your feet. In other words, go on demonstrations against the war, don't vote. Um, um, and Humphrey, you know, he lost a popular vote by very little. He lost the electoral vote pretty handily. But, um, that sure would have made a difference, but I think it's certainly true that uh, you know people like me thought America was, if not ready for a revolution, it needed a revolution, and uh, whether it needed a revolution or not is a different question. But it certainly wasn't ready for one. <laughs> um, and we forget Ronald Reagan, you know, became a major figure in American politics when he ran for governor in 1966 in California, and one of the key things he ran against was the trouble at Berkeley, you know. Clean up the trouble at Berkeley, which was the free speech movement, also was anti-war demonstration in '65, and it amazed people that liberal California was very liberal back then and had elected, you know, uh, Edmund Pat Brown, um, Jerry Brown's father, twice uh, pretty easily, uh, once against Richard Nixon in 1962. Uh, he loses in a landslide to this actor who never, you know, run for office before. How could that happen? It was because, in large, not only, but but in part because of. Um, the uh, backlash against uh, the new left and the anti-war movement, as well as the civil rights movement, uh, it must be admitted. Oh, let me finish, you know, I can, again, talk forever about this, but, but just one personal story, um, which I tell to my, my students when I teach class in the 1960s, which I've been doing since I was in American University 25 years ago. Um, uh, when I had my draft fiscal in May 1970, exactly the same month, May 18th, I remember very well, uh, at the Boston Army base, because I, uh, I was going to school in, in Cambridge then, at Harvard, um, and uh, uh, I, was go I was in the physical with some friends of mine who also had been in SDS, and uh, we basically tried to sabotage the whole thing. We, we stopped at every place along the way and had debates and votes, and uh, uh, we, we, we stretched it out as long as we could. Um, but in the end, I failed because I was a privileged kid. I had a psychiatrist's letter. Um, I told uh, the doctor at the end that if he let me in the army, I would shoot my officers. Um, and, and then I stuttered seriously, which used to be a way to get out of the army. If you stammered seriously, that was one of the ways you could get uh, uh, into Furman. Um, and I had stammered a lot as a kid. Um, so I could put it on again. Um, so I, I got out, I was happy, I got what was called a 1Y, which was not a 4F, but it meant only in a national emergency could I be called up. So I go out, and I'm really happy, I see a kid there looking really sad, uh, not dressed very well, and I've been a draft counselor, people who never draft counselor. I knew how to get people yeah. to try to apply for conscious objective status. So I go to this kid and said, hey, I'm a draft counselor. I can help get you out. He said, uh, excuse my four little words, get me out, shit, man. You know, uh, and he had a very thick Boston accent. He was from, he was from Southie, Irish Catholic from South Boston. Um, he said, I, I better pass this physical because my father was, you know, um, in the Korean War. All my family's been in, in these wars. You know, I don't have a job anyway. And if I don't pass the physical, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. He said, no, I mean, that was exactly my experience at Fort uh, And so, and so that, 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 if I didn't know there's a class divide here, yeah. um, I, I soon learned it. The, the, the black kids, all of them passed. Basically, do they think that their brothers went to the war, their fathers had gone to the war, and it's my turn to go to the war. There was no consciousness, and it was it was class and race. There's no doubt. No There's doubt. a wonderful book uh, by a guy named Christian Abbey called Working Class War, 
about about those who went to Vietnam. It's, it's really worth mentioning. Yeah, jump in. So it's no surprise that one of the first groups really to begin opposing the war were African American leaders at the time. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee folks were very much against the war and, and pushing through draft resistance earlier on, or as early as the students from the Democratic Society. But I just want to sort of take a slightly different approach to something that you're suggesting, because. I don't think this was, I don't think there was necessarily a causality between the anti-war movement and what we're seeing today in the reaction. And I'll explain to you with a couple little things as quickly as I can. In 1968, um, in the Indiana primary, which Robert Kennedy won, when they actually looked at many of the votes that were cast in the a general election, a lot of those people who voted for Robert Kennedy voted for George Wallace. Okay, now, dial back four years earlier to an article that Theodore White wrote in Life Magazine. And if you haven't read it, you should, October 1964, called Backlash. Before the Vietnam War hit in any way, shape, or form, and what he was showing was backlash in white working class communities toward any form of job or residential or educational integration. Okay? And what he said at the end of this, and I'm going to misquote him and just paraphrase him, which is that the Republican Party has a choice to make. Will it become a party that keeps with its tradition of racial harmony that it was born out of, or will it become an all-white party? This was October of 1964 by the legendary journalist Theodore White, basically arguing that it was backlash based on race that was creating these problems. And he would talk about Democratic mayors being tossed out or tossed out in primaries if they were too pro-integration. And you can actually look at the history and trace this back to cities like Detroit and Gary, Indiana in the 40s and 50s where Democrats were being tossed out if they were considered too pro-black. In union towns and unions that were, in many ways, not all of them, racially discriminatory. So my sense is that the Vietnam War added to that class resentment. Um, because of the white working class kids going on. Um, and then you put on top of that inflation because of Lyndon Johnson's policies um, and the white working class getting stuck in that way. And you can see how those resentments would build, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it was the Vietnam or anti-war movement. It was a whole lot of things that got involved. I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna just comment. I think, yes, but, um, uh, but, but there were obviously also a lot of of liberal Democrats, you know, uh, who believed in integration and pushed it, like, I mean, Hubert Humphrey, for example. I mean, they were liberal anti-communists. Uh, yeah. And people like Barry Rustin, uh, who helped to plan the March on Washington in 1963, he was afraid that when King uh, spoke out against the war, a famous speech he gave at Riverside Church in New York in April 1967, that that would destroy the coalition. So, you know, anyway, we should, we should find out what people Anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have about five <laughs> minutes of people want to, and yeah. could you please uh, identify yourself uh, keep it brief if you can, but make a comment or a question. Yeah. Tim Crowley, originally from Youngstown, Ohio, now Columbus, Ohio, so I identify with the 10th state. Um, the one thing you should know about where you're sitting right now, I'm getting the spam risk. Uh, anyway, this was Carol Quigley's classroom. Oh, yes. And in terms of people who turned it around, coming from Ohio, you just bought whatever they were selling. I come in here freshman year, he teaches this history of civilization. If I remember right, Bill, three questions were asked during the entire class because he was in control. We were either loving the guy, just scared to death of him, and I'll put myself in that category. I mean, I got a D the first semester, and I thank Jesus I said. So did I. <laughs> he did a teach-in at American University. I think it was in 1968. And he got up, the place was packed. People came over from Georgetown, bum a car, take a bus, walk, whatever. The place was packed. He was absolutely eloquent, spoke of Vietnam as being a civil war and all this and that. When we saw somebody that we respected that much, laying it out in a very analytical fashion, that really, really turned a lot of views, or otherwise asked the hippies yeah. versus Nixon. Anybody else want to make a comment before we move on to the next set of uh, issues? Yeah, right here. Uh, what about Muhammad Ali? Oh, your name? Yeah, Charles Kenny. Yeah. Uh, 
What about Muhammad Ali with race, anti-Vietnam, uh, and how, how did he figure into all this? Well, he's the most famous athlete in the world, and one of the most famous people in the world. You know, um, I'm more famous than both. You know, <laughs> um, he's like he's like the Beatles. You know, uh, uh, more so. Uh, and and so that had obviously had an impact. You know, um, but as Len was saying, he was that that was in, that famous comment. You know, no Viet Cong ever called the N word. Um, was 66, I think, early 67. So so already, you know, um, many people, most people in the black freedom movement have turned against the war. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, he was converted to the Nation of Islam by Malcolm X, you know, who was dead by then. But um, uh, so it was, it, we like to think it was incredibly important. I think it was, but and there's hardly anybody's really studied it exactly as far as I know. But, it, you know, it was part of the mix, I think, by that, by that time. Uh, but the fact that he was, um, that the, the championship was taken away from him. The heavyweight champion of the world used to matter a lot in the 60s. You know? I don't even know what it is now, but it really mattered a lot back then. Uh, and so obviously it, was, it encouraged people like me you know, and other young people to say, well, if Muhammad Ali is doing this, then you know, we better do something just as daring and maybe illegal you know, as well. Any other quick comments? Otherwise, we're going to, uh, yeah, right here in front. Yeah. Yeah, um, mine's up. about Lyndon Johnson. You have to talk about the Voting Rights Act. You know, I came to uh, Georgetown from a white Irish town of suburban Long Island. I had no idea about the extent of, of the discrimination, et cetera, in the South. Um, and, and, and that must have contributed to, but it certainly. Well, how do you see it today? Well, we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about social movements in oh, the next okay. section, so we'll do that. One, one final yeah, comment here. Yes. John Newman from Los Angeles. What's one thing, I was a draft counselor when I started law school in 71 in Los Angeles, and Nixon, to me, was a pretty good strategist. He abolished the draft, and that really, that confused, in my opinion, went away. And it was a brilliant movement. I just thought that yeah, it, it, it diffused a lot of that because mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. Well, but actually, actually could I add one thing about that? Sorry, tell me the story of the anti-war movement as well as being active in it. But um, it's by 73, when the draft was abolished, the anti-war movement basically had gone away too. I mean, not entirely, but because, you know, the peace treaty had been signed and American troops were out, uh, POWs came home. So, you know, it wasn't the same peace movement. Had been. I mean, the last gasp of the peace movement was really 72 when the government campaign. Um, and of course, he got elected with the last slide, so. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie, you didn't mention that women were not eligible for the drafts, which has <laughs> always rankled me. <laughs> well, so, I mean, you raise a good point going to social reform about the yeah. backlash against ERA, and one of the most powerful arguments was that it would make women eligible for yeah. the draft, which was actually very awkward for women's rights activists because many of them came out of the peace and anti-war movement because the truth is that the Equal Rights Amendment should be ratified and should make women eligible for the draft. Okay, okay well, we're, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to get, get into it. Going on, there was the civil rights movement. There was Cesar Chavez and the uh, uh, migrant farm workers movement. You all remember boycotting lettuce and grapes. I think I was probably so much anti vegetables that I didn't care that we were. <laughs> <laughs> we're um, catch it. Yeah, yeah. There was environmentalism. There was a consumer movement. Um, uh, and the question really is, why did so many of these movements arise up at the same time? Really, or more, more, more or less, at the same time? Uh, did they feed off each other? Uh, were the pluses and minuses of that all happening at once? And so, Katie, maybe we'll start with you. And, and the feminist movement, actually, as you mentioned, had its roots, really, in, in what happened in the 60s. Really kind of flowered more in the 70s, but really, I would say started in part because women uh, 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 were going to college in greater numbers in, in the 60s. Uh, the birth, birth control gave women greater control over their bodies back to, uh, from the 60s. Marriage rates were going down, divorce rates were going up, so women had uh, more uh, freedom. Uh, and uh, could you talk a little bit about what the 60s meant for the women's movement in subsequent decades? Sure. So the traditional way that women's history has been taught, uh, and I was trained in the mid-90s, and this is how we did it, 
is that we would talk about the development of different branches of feminism. There was the equal rights branch of feminism that culminated in the founding of the National Organization of Women in 66 that was um, based in very familiar concepts of liberalism and equality, that women wanted equal rights. This came out of a less radical um, an advocacy for the Equal Rights Amendment that was actually in some ways drawing on um, its origins, right? I don't know if you know the, the beginnings of the Equal Rights Amendment is that it was introduced by the National Women's Party after um, suffrage was achieved in 1920. The National Women's Party pivoted to um, promoting the Equal Rights Amendment. And in the 1920s, it was seen as a very elitist strategy that was designed to give rights to women that were, say, lawyers and doctors, right, who actually had been going to uh, professional school in the teens and 20s, but was seen as actually really anti-working class because working class women wanted protective labor rights. They wanted protection in workplaces that were really hazardous. Okay, so fast forward, there's one branch we were taught that was the equal rights kind of approach, based in liberalism, we want the same rights as men. Then there was an approach that supposedly, as the story goes, came out of the new left and the civil rights movement by, both, by mostly white women, but also African American women, who faced enormous sexism from their peers in the civil rights movement, right? So many of them, for example, went to Freedom Summer and they felt that they were, um, they were given menial chores in SNCC, for example, right? They only got to type memos. Um, or they were expected to be always sexually available. Um, and that that was the flip side, right, of the so-called sexual revolution. By the way, the pill became public and approved in 1961, but it wasn't approved for unmarried women until 72, the, something like that, yes. Um, there were ways around that. It was very common. There's a great article about the University of Kansas Health Center, not a place you think of as full of liberals, that the doctors at the University of Kansas' Student Health Center did a lot of wink, wink, nod, nod about girls would pass around a fake wedding ring and go in and say that they were married and they would get the pill because it was legal for married women. And there were strategies. As I don't need to tell you, there's strategies for getting birth control if you want it. But it wasn't actually as widely available as we think. Um, anyway, that story has kind of fallen apart with subsequent generations of historians looking at it. We now see that there were deep roots for women's activism, for example, in the labor movement. United Auto Workers had a division of uh, women that were very active in the movement. African American women had been pushing um, equalitarian um, strategies and radical feminism in some other ways. So uh, I forget where I was going with this except to say that we, we told the story as these two separate categories, but in fact, there were a lot of pretty radical women as part of the NOW coalition, and there were a lot of um, a lot more blend between the kind of um, uh, what's establishment approach to equal rights feminism and radical feminism. Uh, and this is where um, the personalist political came about, right? Um, and um, in consciousness raising groups in which women, um, I'll just say, I want to mention this as a, as a wife and mother and professional woman. Um, consciousness raising groups, right, where women would come in, it, it appeared, they were told these were complaints. My my boyfriend never helps with the dishes, or I change all the diapers, or, um, you know, I have to do all the housework even though we both have full-time jobs. And in these consciousness raising groups, right, these women realized that these weren't personal problems, these were, these were actually systemic problems. And I want to raise this because my students still struggle with this, and I think the COVID years, as someone who had a child in pre-K and a teenager during COVID, those have not gone away. Um, society has still not created a structure to accommodate what women in consciousness groups more than 50 years ago were trying to address. Um, and I think that's a very grave problem. Um, so I just want to say they raised it, but they have not solved it. Uh, Michael, uh, I mentioned the fact that you know we had all these things going on at the same time in the 60s. How did, you see, how did you see that they fed off each other or contradicted each other? Any <coughs> tensions between them? <laughs> tensions, yeah. Um, well, one thing, understanding why these movements all arise, there's a couple things I think we're talking about. First, um, and let me talk about this, you know, the, the black freedom struggle was the borning struggle, as Bernice uh, Regan, who um, was a very uh, former American University professor, uh, uh, an activist uh, at the time, talked about it. I mean, 
Um, you know, the, the idea that America is fighting, you know, uh, against communism, which is unfree, undemocratic uh, um, uh, ideology and a set of powers, uh, uh, and yet, you know, black people in the South can't vote and uh, can't have equal facilities, can't go to, can't go to, don't have good schools to go to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this contradiction uh, was uh, so clear and so obvious that uh, a lot of people began to see other contradictions uh, in what was, you know, a pretty much hegemonic, you know, liberal ideology at the time. They were conservatives, but but, conservative, but even Dwight Eisenhower, the only Republican president from 1932 to, to 1968, was a pretty moderate Republican, you know, um, and he accepted a lot of the New Deal. So um, it often happens historically that that when uh, people begin to see cracks in the dominant structures, in the dominant ideology, then uh, there's all kinds of ways for that ideology to begin to fall apart. You know, I mean, that happened some ways with, uh, with the end of the Cold War in, in the Eastern Bloc, though, you know, Putin might be trying to put it back together again. Um, but I, I think that um, that's one of the things that was going on. Now, of course, the movements fed off each other. Uh, the women's movement, uh, the 60s, the second wave women's movement, in many ways, uh, it was Katie said it began, uh, so the book, you know, women's movement was around from, yeah, from 1830s and 40s, uh, but it certainly got a new rush of uh, energy from women who've been to the left, that women who've been in the black freedom movement. Um, and uh, like Bernice Reagan, like uh, Angela Davis, like uh, many others. Um, and, and then other people, as I said before in my introductory comments, the idea that everyone should have rights and should define their rights in their own way you know, uh, was really, really important, I think. Uh, because then, if we, if we were open to, you know, if you're gay in the closet, what about my rights? If you're disabled, what about, you know, be able to, you know, without a tremendous help, be able to get on a bus, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, that language was used in the anti-war movement, too. I remember a poster, anti-war poster, uh, one of the anti-war marches I went to, I went to lots of in the 60s and early 70s. Um, the poster was, um, one man, one vote. Freedom, uh, Mississippi, Vietnam. You know, uh, it was a reference to the fact that uh, there, was, there was, I'm sure, that um, uh, uh, under the Geneva Accords that settled the French War uh, against against the, uh, the Viet Minh, uh, there was supposed to be an election for all of Vietnam to choose a government, and and uh, the U.S. Uh, didn't allow that to happen because, as Eisenhower said in his memoirs, Ho Chi Minh probably would have won, um, and. Uh, not to say Ho Chi Minh was a, a real Democrat, a small d, but, um, uh, and, and so the connections were made all the time between all of these movements. Uh, in, in, in Weatherman, we had a, a, a poster, Viet Cong women carry guns. <laughs> uh, if, you know, women are equal in, in the struggle in Vietnam, you know, fighting the United States, but they're not equal here. So uh, connections were used, were, were made all, the yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it was, it was weather people. Okay. Uh, weatherman came for the Bob Dylan song, but, you know, obviously. Uh, but anyway, so so I think I think um, those connections were seemed obvious at the time because sort of the liberal consensus was was falling apart. Len, uh, there was mention of some of the civil rights legislation that passed in the in the in the '60s, the Voting Rights Act, the uh, Civil Rights Act. Uh, looking back now in that period, where we are today. Do you think that that movement for that appreciably changed the hearts and minds of most Americans, or to what extent are we still struggling with those issues, even though you know we the legislation changed things in, in terribly important ways, not to dis discount them? Well, you know, I think uh, Michael was saying earlier that um, he was maybe naive or something in, in terms of some of your political work. And I think there was a generational naivete that we could change the world in just a few years. Um, but that's not how social change works. It's slower. It's more difficult. There are two steps forward and one step back. So yes, the changes from the 1960s were profound. They're deep. They're institutional. They're attitudinal, they're normative in so many fundamental and profound ways. It doesn't mean that we have gotten to the promised land that Martin Luther King talked about, but you get there slowly, gradually, making changes in generations. Um, now, you mentioned Lyndon Johnson earlier, um, who to me is the King Lear of the 1960s. Um, um, but remember, it was in August of 1960, 
five that Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, and five days later, Watts came about. Um, and Martin Luther King uh, was, came to Watts and had a conversation with a teenager um, who came up to him, running up to him and saying, we won, we won, and Dr. King says, how could you say we won? We've lost all these people, our neighborhoods are burnt down, and the kid responded, we won because we made them pay attention to us, okay? Um, and so what was going on was not just legis legislative, it was in terms of reshaping the culture and the values and the thinking of the United States that ultimately would emerge in the Black Power Movement and Black is Beautiful uh, and a fundamental realignment of what it means to uh, have dignity in the United States. Remember, in, um, in many civil rights marches, uh, uh, black uh, protesters were not walking around talking about legislation. The men who were marching were walking around with placards that said, I am a man. In other words, respect me for my humanity. So there are different layers of transformation that go on in the society. They're political, they're cultural, and legal. But I will say this, because I'm trying to tie together some of the thoughts on the social movements. Um, one of the most important uh, phenomena of the 1950s was the rise of higher education. I think you had about one out of every seven college-age kids before World War II going uh, to higher education. By 1970, it was about 50% or more. Higher education for many years had been uh, the space for the privileged in society. What it became transformed to in the early 60s was a place for a generation. And as the generation began to germinate and create this generational consciousness, what did you see? You saw black students from historically black colleges being the ones to do the sit-ins in Greensboro and Jackson and other uh, cities throughout uh, the south of the United States. Then you saw the free speech movement emerging at Berkeley. Um, and what I, many of us like to call, and you mentioned Mississippi, the Mississippi metaphor, that what was happening is a lot of people were saying, maybe there's a little bit, mis bit of Mississippi throughout the United States, throughout our colleges, throughout the entire country. So I think what happened was that um, there was this generational transformation and, and profound change that was moving through society in so many ways. So it hit the women's movement. It hit the LGBTQ movement. Daniel Ankolovich, the great pollster, did, uh, did a survey in 1971 of college-age students. And he found that you know, there was a vast number, over 80%, who, who said there's deep discrimination against women, against black people, against what were called Mexican-Americans at the time. And in fact, the largest uh, number saying that there was discrimination against of that generation was people uh, who were LGBTQ, or as the, the wording of the time went, homosexuals. So there was a generational transformation in attitudes that was going on at the time that I think knit together all of these movements, and in large part, the locus of all of this was higher education colleges and university, because that became a place to be able to create, foment, foment develop, and nourish, and sustain, and act out a generational identity. So for me, yes, all of those amazing legislators who passed the Voting Rights Act were so consequential. But the summer before was Freedom Summer, when you had Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney killed in Mississippi, and other people brutalized the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, calling out the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party at the time. And it's that's what gave the energy to be able to transform so much of what was happening. And one other quick point from the 50s. One of the most consequential moments of the 1950s was August 28, 1955, and that was the murder of Emmett Till. Because every young person coming of age, every young black person coming of age said, I am Emmett Till. And if you want to know how some of that generational consciousness began to develop, you go back to those days and you see every single black person saying, I am Emmett Till, and the rest is history. Can I make one, one, one yeah. quick comment about, about uh, the college things, you know, uh, really important. Um, <laughs> People forget or uh, don't remember that the period from late 40s to early 70s was the most, not just the most prosperous time in American history, but the most time of the most shared prosperity. And that meant if you're going to college, and of course, as you was saying, more and more people were going to college. Uh, all these state university campuses began to crop up all over the place, uh, not just one or two, but you know, several in, in, in all the big states, um, community colleges and everything else. Uh, most people went to college when they got out, especially most white people. I think that was true of a lot of black people too. Uh, we're not, you think, you have a college education, you will get a job, and probably a pretty good job, you know, which even our students at elite school like Georgetown, 
you know, yeah, they'll get a job, but they're not quite sure what kind of job uh, they're going to get. Uh, and, and so the, the shared prosperity also made it easier, I think, to take, you know, um, risks uh, yeah. for a young person. Right. Not, not to have to worry, you know, oh, I'll get arrested, but, you know, I'll get arrested, but I'll still get a good job. And college costs Well, I, I mean, right. I, I didn't really remember graduating from Georgetown, and it never crossed my mind that I couldn't get a job. Right. It was more a question of, on what profession will I give my great resources <laughs> <laughs> to share my, you know, I mean, and, 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 and right, the economic situation yeah. is so totally, we're going to throw this over briefly, any comments, yeah, here, yeah. Larry Christmas, Washington, D.C., I just want to ask, what, um, to what extent did the mass media, and the entertainment industry, and so on, support or <coughs> stimulate these social movements? Okay, we're going to take one other question and we'll kind of get the joint answer here. Yeah, yeah. Mike Burke from Kansas City. Uh, Missouri or Kansas? <laughs> Missouri. Uh, I want to ask about legacy. Uh, you're absolutely correct in describing how our earth changed. I mean, when, when we were here at Georgetown, everything turned upside down. You know, we rebelled against the, the 50s notion of our, our parents and we, we, we saw all these issues come to life. And there was a feeling, I think, when we graduated that we were going to go out and change the world. My thought is we didn't go far enough. And that our generation got bogged down in consumerism, in things, in acquiring things, and really failed to change the world to the extent that we thought we could. Any comments about our legacy? Okay, so the impact of cultural, the cultural industry and the cultural norms, and also the, yeah. Did, did we lose it, basically? <coughs> yeah. That was a good question. I think we should address the first yeah. one. Yeah. 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 And I'll connect both. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's a fascinating question. I mean, the, the as you know, there were, uh, the media industry was much more concentrated than, you know, three major channels, and, uh, uh, and but, in terms of, of, of uh, electronic media, um, but of course the local papers everywhere, so it was, yeah. it was less uh, it, less concentrated in that sense. And local papers really mattered. You know, a lot of people only read a local paper. They didn't read the New York Times. Of course, there's no no nothing online. Um, you know, I think I think um, for people in these movements and even those who oppose the movements, uh, um, uh, music and film and television are actually more important. You know. Uh, then, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the press was important, of course, you know, who was Times Man of the Year, Matter, that kind of stuff, but, but mostly the people who, uh, who were already engaged. But if you want to engage, you know, I remember Easy Rider came out. That was a big deal, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and of course, rock and roll um, and soul music were, um, were at first frowned on, and even, you know, Frank Sinatra said rock and roll was the ugliest music he ever heard. Uh, <laughs> And then he ended up doing stuff with Bono, you know. But, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there's, you know, it, it, I mentioned before that, that that was so. So I think the divisions about that were important too. On the legacy question, really quickly, um, you know, I'm not. This is controversial. I'm not that big on generational history, actually. You know, there are a lot of people in my generation who were conservative and became more conservative, and, and the conservative movement uh, was built by people our age, uh, my age, <laughs> Bruce's age. Uh, um, as much as the, as, as, the, as the left was. Uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, we were going through common uh, events, uh, but we went through it in very different ways. We talked about Vietnam. So, so uh, you know, it, I wish our generation had solved all the problems of the world, but, you know, no generation solves problems. You know, people solve problems. that I don't think that has survived that I find endlessly frustrating 
is that feminism is not lean in. Feminists in the 1960s and 1970s, the movement did not envision that the success of feminism was women like me, lawyers and doctors all across Washington, D.C., predominantly white, paying low-wage immigrant labor to care for their children and do housework while they succeed. That's not feminism. And I, and I really, I, I, we've lost that thread. Feminism was fundamentally rethinking the roles of men and women and thinking about, I've been thinking how we didn't talk about Catholicism very much. Many of the women I'm describing here were not Catholic, would, were ex-Catholics, but one thing I've learned about teaching here is about the dignity of the person. Feminism was ultimately about the dignity and humanity of women and men to realize their highest potential, no matter the color of their skin, their age, their marital status, right? So one thing that I wish that we had retained was a sense that work is not the end-all, be-all, and that everyone participates in productive and reproductive labor. I'm here on a Saturday morning because my husband is with my children, right? Uh, not because I've hired someone to watch them, not that that's wrong, but that rethinking that, you know, when I read about women my age, right, professional age, upper middle class women, that the solution to every marriage problem and every work professional problem is to hire low wage labor to do the work that is beneath you, that's not a win for feminism. So I, I know that sounds really preachy, but that's something that I'm really trying to underscore to my students. And the beauty at Georgetown, I'll tell just this one anecdote because I came here to talk about the students. It's legacy. Yeah, yeah. It's legacy. I had this conversation in a big class on women's history one time, and one student raised her hand and she said, I'm from a working class Cuban family in New York City. And she said, my aunt is a nanny. So all these other women are coming from, you know, they're from Long Island and they're from northern New Jersey and they're, and she said, my aunt is a, is a nanny and her kids, I'll never forget the term she said, she said, her kids, my cousins had to go to cheapo daycare. She said, but she always laughed because her kids had more fun at cheapo daycare with old toys playing with other kids than the kids that she nannied for who were really lonely. And I thought, this just blew up this conversation. And I think that's a legacy that has become undercut. So, so I'm kind of like, the, 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 let, why don't we start on legacy, like, but let me amplify it. Because you want, you want to have more people be able to do that. I just want to get some of the media. Okay, yeah. Why don't you talk about, briefly about the media? Yeah. I'll do my best to be brief. Um, obviously, media was very important. It showed a window to the world, particularly when we saw Birmingham and Bill Connor. And, and then, of course, with Vietnam as well, bringing that into everybody's living room, as it was called the living room war. I think Michael is right that rock and roll is an underestimated uh, importance in terms of transforming society. You have to think back that the Beatles were opening for Little Richard at one point before the Beatles became big. Um, and it was the merging of, of uh, race in terms of music, but also the sexuality of music. There were video clips of Elvis Presley on the stage doing his uh, pelvic up thrust, and you cut away to the young people who were screaming and to the old people who were sitting there like this in absolute stern silence, totally freaked out by what was going on. But you also had, as I mentioned earlier, Mad Magazine. There was a survey in the late 50s, I believe, of college students that after Life Magazine, Mad Magazine was the second most popular and pervasive magazine around. And then you had the growth in the 1960s of the alternative media, which did spawn a lot of the new generation of reporters that we begin to see today, and in many ways transformed journalism from something that just reported to spoke truth to power. And I think we're seeing that in many ways. Um, so, but there's, you know, one other, uh, and I'll get back to legacy, but there's one other thing, because I do, I, I wrote a book on generation, so we may disagree on some of this. Um, but you talk about that. Hegemonic, hegemonic liberalism, okay? Yes and no. We can call it liberalism, but there is a difference between old union liberals and new younger generation liberals. Old union liberals were, were uh, tied to uh, uh, agencies and organizations and hierarchies and rules and tradition, whereas the new generation basically blew all of that up, was anti-hierarchical, anti-rule, anti-organization. Anti-liberal. We were liberals. And in some ways, yeah, anti of the old liberal, okay? But the fascinating thing to me about that is that the old liberalism was tailor-made for the industrial economy. The new liberalism was tailor-made for the creative economy. And if you want to see one of the great legacies of the 1960s, 
It's how they blew up that old form of liberalism and created the type of culture and mindset that allowed people to create this new creative economy, which is what really runs our economic structure today. So you have to look at the, the link between the culture and the economy to understand one of the most powerful and important legacies of the 60s that's very, very rarely discussed. We, we, we have a nice photo uh, in our book, uh, American Divide, of Steve Jobs, who was turned on by the whole Earth catalog. Steve Jobs, like, you know, personal computers, you know, everyone can have a computer in their homes, and, you know, you don't have to go to UNIVAC and these huge right. things, you know, because the people can control their own technology. And now, you know, like, have, let, me, let me, like, let me, let me, let me ask you a question, though. I mean, but well, shouldn't they have, we're not, yeah, yeah, we're talking about this legacy. Yeah. And all, you know, the, the, move, the environmental movement and the legacy of that and the women's movement, et cetera. Were there movements of the 60s that somehow kind of died out? And what I'm thinking of in part is the anti-poverty movement, right? And were there other, were there things that we were, were pretty prominent then, which, you know, kind of faded from Well, to, to, be, to be honest, it really wasn't an anti-poverty movement. I mean, there was a, there was a, a, a movement, a, it was a black freedom movement focused on poverty, you know. Black well, there was people. Michael Harrington, there was, well, that, know, but he, that was Bobby a book. Kennedy that was a going book. to Mississippi and talking about but, poverty. But we're talking about movement, I mean, social movement is a lot of people who have a strategy, have organizations, yeah, yeah. have yeah. media, and, um, uh, and most of that was, was about race. And part of the reason why, unfortunately, um, well, the anti-poverty program failed, didn't have much money as part of it, but also because uh, it was perceived as only helping black people. Uh, uh, or sometimes Native Americans or, 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 or Chicanos, um, and and uh, and obviously it was not a universal program, and so um, you know it was one of the, the anti-poverty program probably helped conservatives grow more than it did help. But it did help poor people too. I mean, we had food stamps which still exist, uh, not called that anymore, but um, and uh, Head Start and so forth. Some good programs, really important programs, came out of it. But I don't think there's really a movement. Well, well, so, that, and let me yeah. just yeah. come back. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid as well, yeah. Yeah. very important, but. I think the connection to, to Vietnam is really important. Uh, pardon my French here, but Linda Johnson once said that bitch of war killed the lady I love. Yeah. And what he meant by that is the Vietnam War undermined um, uh, the great society. Right. And to, he, he did a devil's bargain because he kept borrowing money throughout Vietnam and ultimately had to start paying for it. And the deal he struck with Congress to be able to pay for it was to cut money from the great society just as it was taking off. And so what happened is that the, the sort of white working class conservatives, seeing their kids go to war, seeing inflation take place, seeing that taxes were an index to inflation and therefore having less money in the pocket, they weren't going to blame the Vietnam War. Who did they blame? They blamed the great society for basically undercutting their, uh, their way of life. So you're right. I think that really helped to create that conservative movement to suggest that the war on poverty had actually failed when it had barely gotten off the ground and then was starved of money because of the Vietnam War. And all of that got conflated together. Let me, let me ask you all a question, though, because we really want to get back to the audience. And that question is... Why don't you get to the audience right away? Yeah. I'll okay. 12 minutes. Well, I'll throw it up, I'll throw it up to you. The, it's, it's their reunion. Yeah, 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 exactly. Our generation is the generation that voted most for Donald Trump. So the question is, is that our legacy? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> anyway, no. yeah. Question here. Comment. You talked about the growth of religious tolerance in the 60s and 70s, specifically Catholics and Jews yeah. breaking the glass seal and being admitted to elite clubs. Why did that take place, and why aren't you addressing? Yeah. Where will we have? <laughs> no, I think that's a good question. I noticed that we had really not talked about religion. Yeah. But I think it falls under the category of institutions. A lot of, you know, religious uh, attendance has been declining yes. precipitously, right, since the late 1960s, in part because of this anti-hierarchy, anti anti-institution movements that felt these weren't moving enough. On the other hand, I agree with you. I think that has really, really changed. I think the politics around um, denominations has changed a lot, right? That the rhetoric around politics is that Catholics are Christians now in ways that was much less true 50 years. I mean, right, that they, they counted, there wasn't, there's not the same battle between Protestants. But at least our class, I think, and maybe the class prior to ours, was, that, was when Georgetown started to admit more Jews and Protestants. Uh -huh. And the question, I've, it's always been in my mind, is to what extent was that part of the revolution that took place at Georgetown in the sense that 
the kids they were bringing in maybe were less obedient, maybe a little more, you know, uppity. I don't so, know, so but it's an interesting question. There's also, also, I mean, I have a chapter in the book on uh, Mark Divided about religion, and and the first sentence, if I remember correctly, is nothing changed in America so much as American religion in the yeah. 60s. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of reasons for that, but um, so the part of it is, is the uh, denominations and the way um, ritual were uh, in, not, not just among Catholics, but among many Protestant churches and Jews too, was thought by young people to be kind of deadening and didn't address what they were thinking about and doing at the time. And also, the very thing we talked about, people going to colleges, meeting people from other, like you said, meeting people from other, other faiths, um, intermarriage, you know, used to be a big deal when, you know, an Irish, an Irish person married a Pole, right? That was a big deal. Right? Um, <laughs> um, but an Irish Catholic married a Protestant or a Jew or a black person, I mean, that became not accepted right away. But, you know, uh, and that because people were, again, the prosperity moving around much more. So I think, you know, again, uh, the social, the way society was changing helped to change religion. And, of course, vice versa. And I think yeah. there was a degree of, of sense of hypocrisy yeah. Yeah. that piety and faith were not the same. Right. Um, and if there's that classic scene at the end of The Graduate where Dustin Hoffman is swinging the cross, okay, right. which I think is very symbolic of, of how young people were seeing religion at that moment in time, where everybody was in the church doing their thing, but they actually didn't have sort of a degree of meaning. And then young people were seeing a lot of ministers and priests and rabbis and others being silent during uh, civil rights and, and Vietnam, even though many ministers, priests, and rabbis did get involved, okay? But in the larger scheme of things, lots of people were really silent about some of those injustices. Um, but I don't think faith went away. You began to see the rise of the New Age spirituality. So what happened is that it was a generation that seemed to value spirituality over organized religion in many ways, and that became sort of the priority. Okay, question and comment here. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to bring you all to the present, back to the present. Speak up a little bit? Yes, yeah, speak yeah. up. Okay. Back uh, to the present. I, I want to bring you all back to the present, okay? And uh, so the New York Times wrote an article the other day about uh, taking cancel culture to task for uh, basically suppressing uh, diverse thought. And so my question really is to all of you is uh, to what extent do you feel, if you acknowledge the concept of cancel culture, to what extent do you feel it um, undermines the uh, values and ideals of progressive politics today? Good question. Great question. Yeah. We have eight minutes. We have eight minutes. Yeah. Can you repeat it, please? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Repeat the question. The question is, do you feel that the cancel culture of today the question the question is, does the cancel culture of today repute the kind of openness of the and discussion of the 1960s and things that were going on, say, on this campus in terms of conversations that if you had that same conversation today uh, might be canceled, basically. Can I just yeah. quickly say I think that's an overblown story, just the same as is your comment that everybody became materialistic consumerist. You go back to the 1984 Newsweek magazine cover story on yuppies. <laughs> and buried in the story was the fact that there was uh, that, that it was only represented three or four percent of that generation. Yet it became overblown as a media narrative, as I think cancel culture is today. Okay. I'm on a college campus, and we have really vibrant discussions constantly about things. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you what is not necessarily accepted, which is bigotry. Okay, <laughs> and so. And there's a line that does get crossed. And you have to understand that a college campus is not just a free speech platform. It's a community where people have to feel comfortable being in the classroom with each other and knowing that the institution respects them. So I think you have to, you know, you can't go into a church and start screaming about atheism. You'll be booted out immediately, all right? But I'm in a college, it's not a church. It's not a church, it's a, but it's a community. It's a community in the we pursuit of knowledge. knowledge. Yeah. Anyway. It's a community <laughs> in the pursuit of knowledge, and I'm not so sure racism <laughs> is knowledge. Yeah, any other comments? Yeah. So I, I think his comment, I really like the way he put that, actually. Um, I think it is not irrelevant, but it is overblown. I'll say at Georgetown, we have, this is not so much of an issue here, this is not, as much of a gotcha culture as some other college campuses are, right? I will say uh, that. I also think that one of the ways that it gets overblown is that just as you, there's lots of settings where some things are appropriate to talk about and some aren't. I think we, you're not wrong to say some people feel 
a little bit silenced. The question is, is that actually new? Is that actually, is, is that something that the classroom can solve? Um, and so I think this issue of community, you know what it reminds me of? In, in Barack Obama's uh, memoir, he talks about his first term in the Senate, and he talks about all the discussion about consensus. Why can't we pass legislation? Why isn't there more borrowed partisanship? And he said, well, the greatest generation, you know, it used to be the previous generation in the Senate were all white guys of a similar age, and they all served in World War II, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, and they had a lot in common. He said, the reality is that our community is way, way more diverse now, even in that place that's not as diverse as it could be. He said, it's more diverse than it used to be, and we don't have the common ground. And I think the college classroom is a little bit like that too. And people are still figuring out what they can talk about and what they feel they can't talk about. And sometimes it's because they shouldn't talk about it. And sometimes it might be that they should, but not always. Um, I've, got, I've got a different view about this. And I'm, I'm on the left, obviously. Um, I edited a socialist magazine. I teach courses on conservatism, on <coughs> radicalism, and on socialism. Um, and and um, I think, as Katie said, George, Georgetown is a pretty tolerant place. I mean, I, you know, I had a, um, a friend of mine who's a conservative, uh, Chris Caldwell, come in in my conservatism class and talk about a book he wrote where, where the basic thesis that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was a bad idea. Uh, not because he's a racist, but because he thought it, it gave rise to a division of American society that shouldn't be there. So I think there's a difference between, you know, screaming at people, you know, using the N-word if that was something, I mean, clearly, bigotry, and having honest debate about issues like that, for example. I think it should be possible uh, for students to debate whether the 64 Civil Rights Act was a good idea or not, um, without being called racist, you know. Um, and it should be a good idea for people to say that they disagree with, with same-sex marriage, you know. Uh, and, uh, but again, you have to have debates. You can't, you know, just throw these things out. Um, but I do think, you know, I mean, Colleges like Georgetown, uh, and most colleges these days, are pretty much, you know, liberal to left-wing places, especially humanities and social sciences, you know. STEM, you know, can be very different. But, um, and, and uh, it, I, think, I think that's a problem for my side, for our side, I should say, because um, part of the way, and we saw this in the Virginia governor's race, you know, uh, last fall, part of the way in which conservatives you know, uh, do well with so-called culture wars, as they say, those liberals are just elitists who don't want, you know, to, to debate these, these issues. Now, I think for the most part that's not, that's not true, but the perception is out there, and I feel very uncomfortable if my students are not able to raise issues uh, when they think that a debate should be had. I think we should have honest debates about things that really matter in our country. We are a 50-50 country for the most part, you know, uh, Democrats, Republicans, and and um, it should, we, should, we should have a safe space to debate things that, that, that matter to people in America.